Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, His Excellency Gauri Shamura Bhukha, uh, Ambassador of India in, in Hungary. And let me introduce you in a few words, His Excellency. Gauri Shamura Bhukha was born in Aitgar, probably I can't say a small village in Ayastan, India. He spent his childhood in rural milieu and did his master's in business management. Mr. Gupta is a recipient of many gold medals and awards from excellence during his academic career. He is also a member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. After serving in the private sector for three years, Mr. Gupta joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1981. Since then, he has served in various capacities in Belgium, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Mexico, France, and Philippines. During his assignment in France, he was alternate member of the executive board of UNESCO. Mr. Gupta was India's ambassador to Mongolia from June 2003 to September 2006. Subsequently, he had, was head of administration in the Ministry of External Affairs of India from October 2006 to February 2010. Presently, he is serving as India's ambassador to Hungary and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Recently, in September 2012, Mr. Gupta has published a book titled Unrevealing Mysteries of Life, Modern Science and Ancient Wisdom. This book has been published both in Europe and India in English language. The separate Hungarian edition has also been published, as I know if you want to have it, you can find it here. We have a few copies. Mr. Gupta also contributed many articles in foreign policy and related issues and have, has presided over several conferences on a variety of subjects. Mr. Gupta has delivered over 50 talks at various universities, institutions, business clubs, NGOs, and cultural centers on issues such as development, environment, self-awareness, ethics of life, law of karma, and relationship between men and nature. And we have the privilege that he will deliver a speech here about the development and the climate change. And I would like to ask you to take the floor. We are happy to have you here. Yeah, this is Can I come on? Yeah. To begin with, you na pot I wish I could talk to an Hungarian, but unfortunately I will have to speak in English. And my sincere thanks to Mr. Sandor Kerekes, who organized this talk uh, this afternoon in the university. Uh, he is uh, an excellent professor on environmental studies. He has done a lot of work on this. And uh, I am delighted that uh, he is closely associated with this talk today. And thanks to all of you for coming to listen to me, a stranger from far away place. I am also thankful to Dean Laszlo Sichman, whom I just met, and uh, who was very kind, and he told me that he is deeply interested in uh, South Asia and South Asian studies. So, I am in the familiar surroundings in this university with you. Thank you very much. So let's start our talk on uh, development and climate change. Now let us understand first what do we mean by development. So development is a word which is not very well understood by us many times. Now this is development because on the one hand this is the ancient way of living and this is the modern way of living. Isn't that development? The, the ancient way and the modern way you can see that this, this is how we look at the development. Isn't it? On the right hand side you see the modern way which is called developed way. On the left hand side we see the ancient way which is called uh, not so developed or sometimes even primitive. Is that correct? 
here you can see the the developed world and the most developed. But these are just the pictures. Let me give you some <coughs> more ideas. Oh, there are a lot of pictures eh, on the development, how you look at development. Okay. Now let us go to what do how this whole thing came up. You know Adam Smith, you are all students and you know the economist, very well known economist called Adam Smith and Ricardo uh, in the 17th, 18th century. Adam Smith wrote a book called Wealth of Nations and uh, he thought that more the wealth you have, you know, more developed you are. That's how they started. And then they came this industrial revolution. Industrial revolution means that instead of working with your hand in a small scale way, you produce in a large scale. You have a huge big factory where you can stitch say thousands of dresses in a day or you can produce hundreds of uh, you know computers in a day, things like that. So rather than working manually in, uh, at your uh, place of work, you have these big factories. That was the industrial revolution. And based on these two developments, came a concept called Gross Domestic Product, GDP. You all understand GDP, I suppose. GDP is the sum total of all goods and services produced in a country in one year. Like in Hungary, whatever goods and services are produced, you total them up, that is called GDP of Hungary. Now, you, as a student, you read every time in newspapers, you also see on TV, that every country in this world is trying for high GDP. Because if you have high GDP means you have bigger cake and you can give more to everybody. That is the approach. Because if you have uh, higher GDP means divided by population, you come to a per capita GDP, per capita income, which would be larger. That is the concept that we are based on today. And this is the basis of all economics in the world. Hmm? The only problem is that this concept is based on more production and more consumption. Because you can't have higher GDP unless you have more production and more consumption. You, if you wear only one dress uh, in a year, you are not contributing to GDP. If you wear 100, then you will contribute to GDP because you are buying many, many dresses. Yeah? If you buy only one cell phone in one year, you are not contributing much to GDP. But if you buy, say, 20 cell phones in two years, you are contributing much more to GDP. And similarly, if you buy a glass of milk, you are not contributing much to the economy. But if you buy a, a bottle of wine, because that's much more expensive, so you are contributing more to GDP. Now, the concept of GDP is, has many, many flaws. But it, basically, let me tell you, it is neutral to the quality. If you produce arms and guns and drugs, they are also part of the GDP. If you produce milk and bread and butter, that is also part of GDP. And in fact, the items which are uh, more restrictive, they have higher value, therefore they contribute more to GDP. For example, if you do yoga at home, sitting, you contribute nothing to GDP. But if you go to a gym, you are a member of a gym club, and you are going there, paying some money, then you are contributing to GDP. So the yoga is not helpful, but it, a club is contributing to GDP. If you visit more hospitals every day, you are contributing more to GDP because you are spending more on doctors and hospitalization. But if you are healthy at home, you are not contributing to GDP. So the idea of GDP is neutral to the, uh, the quality. Yeah? It's only concerned with the amount of money which is spent in the economy. So this concept we must understand. There are many, many uh, facets of this concern. There is a very beautiful example which is given in a uh, lot of economics books that if you make love at home with your boyfriend or with your husband, that is not contributing to GDP. But if you go to a prostitute's uh, house and pay, then you are contributing to GDP. So this is, this is the concept of GDP, how it works. So this is uh, development in the modern way means that you must consume more and you must produce more. That is what the basic concept is. Now, as a result, we have large scale production units. We have big shopping plazas. Hmm? Uh, we have uh, P 
people migrating from the rural areas to cities because the rural industries are no longer uh, remunerated, they cannot be competitive. So they are being slowly, slowly wound up because the big units come in the near neighborhood of the cities. They are very competitive, they have huge finances, huge marketing arm, and they cannot allow these small units to survive. And therefore people are migrating to the uh, big cities in large and when they, they migrate to cities, there are problems as well. There are slums, there are crimes. We'll talk about that a little later. Now, UNDP has given a concept of GDP, which defines slightly modified version of GDP now. They have added two elements, that is the education and life expectancy. But still, the concept is basically based on GDP. It's 90% GDP with little changes in that. So that is the basic concept. So development today means more GDP, more per capita income. The more you have, the more developed you are. Like US has say $60,000 per annum per capita income. You have $20,000 per annum per capita income. So they are more developed than you are. This is the simple logic. Okay, This is what development is defined at. Now let's talk about environment. What is environment or what is climate? I'll take it environment rather than taking just climate because that is a larger uh, question. Now as per the ancient uh, wisdom in India as well as in Greece, there are five components of environment. Mm -hmm. Five components. And they are space, without space nothing can exist, like this is the space, so we are existing. This building is exi existing with a larger space. The earth is existing with even larger space. So the space is the one which provides the theater and the holding place for everything. Hmm? It. Nothing can exist without space. That's the first part of the environment. The second part of environment is air. We breathe in, breathe out, plants breathe in, breathe out. Uh, without air, nobody can survive, nothing is possible. So that's the second part of your environment. Then the third part is fire. In uh, ancient Indian wisdom, we call it fire. But you can call it energy in the modern sense, you see. The, it is the sun is the symbol of fire, but fire is far more pervasive than sun. Sun is like a fuel, you, you burn a piece of wood, for example, it gives you fire. Hmm? A piece of wood you burn, it gives you fire. Similarly, sun is a piece of uh, wood, a, a kind of fuel eh? uh, for the fire. Once that fuel is over, uh, the, the, the sun will stop burning, but fire will still exist. Because fire you can't see, it, it exists everywhere. So this is, you can call it energy in, in modern sense. This is the third part of our uh, environment. Fourth part is the water, which we all drink. We know that uh, we, we use water every day, for, from morning to night, till we sleep, and even in the night. Uh, there is a water cycle, which uh, you know that water is from the oceans and lakes is raised up into the atmosphere in terms of water vapor. Billions and trillions of tons of water is raised every second. It goes into the space. It, forms clouds, it travels with the wind thousands and thousands of kilometers and then it falls back again in terms of rain, snow, replenishing your river, your lakes and you know uh, providing you fresh water everywhere to drink. So the nature has created this uh, for us. If we have to transport even 10 liters of water 5 kilometers away, it's a huge task. Hmm? But see the nature how fantastic system it has to transport all this water and provide you fresh water. And then we have this Mother Earth with all the minerals and uh, plants and herbs which uh, uh, we, we see on our Earth. So this is, these are the five components of uh, <coughs> environment I call it. Okay. Now these components of environment we must understand. People talk about coexistence of human and environment. I think that is not a correct assessment. There is no coexistence there. It is the human existence which is at stake. 
the environment, these five elements will exist whether we live or not. Hmm? Because our origin lies in these five. How do we originate? Look at our own origin to begin with. We originate from a drop of semen. Hmm? That is where the birth takes place, conception takes place. And from that, the semen comes from where? It comes from the food we eat inside the body. It is formed from the food. Food comes from where? From Mother Earth, nature. So our origin lies in the nature. Then we eat food every day, we drink water, we breathe every day. That becomes our body. The food we eat becomes our body. What is this flesh, blood, uh, bones we have? This is a miracle of the body which is a different subject. But that food converts into our body. Isn't it? If we don't eat for 10 days, we will be on the, the worth of in, on the way to death. So the food becomes our body. Remember this very much. The food and water we drink becomes our body. So we are given birth by the environment and we are sustained by the environment every second of our life. Hmm? If it is... So the environment is our mother. Hmm? It is our mother. It is not that they are... Environment is not dependent on us. It will exist whether we exist or not. So, but for us, for our existence, it is our mother. We cannot survive without that. Now not only that, the five elements which I spoke about, they are also directly connected to your body. Directly. Your sound, your sense of hearing is connected to the space. All sounds originate. This is the property of the space <laughs> and property of your hearing. This, the sense of touch which we have is connected to the air. It originates from the air and it connects us directly to the air. When the flow of the wind comes, you feel the touch. It, it connects. The sense of sight is connected to the sun or to the fire. You can call it sun because sun is the biggest symbol of fire. But as soon as the sun goes down, you are not able to see. When there is darkness, you can't see. Hmm? So it is directly connected to the, uh, to the fire. Then the sense of taste is connected to water. All taste originates from water. Everything is direct. And then the sense of a smell directly to the earth. All smells originate from the earth. So we are directly, that is why we have five senses in the body and there are five elements of the environment. It's not accidental. This is all science. This is pure science. There is nothing but science in it. And I can give many more examples of this five. Now we must see this, this so-called development because more consumption, more production what we are doing? We are digging a lot of mines, we are using a lot of river waters, we are polluting our lakes, uh, we are taking a lot of, uh, say, petroleum from the earth, and then we are polluting the air. These millions of vehicles which run, they own, uh, they are polluting the air everywhere. So, <coughs> firstly, we are, we are cutting the trees, uh, all the green reeds being destroyed. Uh, we are, the more you want to produce of anything, the more you need from the nature in terms of mineral resources, in terms of energy, in terms of water, in terms of air, and then the more waste you produce. Because the more you produce, the more waste you will produce. If you produce, say, only one computer, the waste would be limited. If you produce 10,000 computers, the waste would be 10,000 times that. So, the more waste is produced. So, you are contaminating more rivers, more lakes. You are contaminating the air more and more. Uh, today, we only have bottled water. But I am telling you that after 2-3 decades, you will have to carry a gas cylinder to survive. Uh, it's not a joke, but it's a reality. Because this water didn't exist 3-30 years ago. No bottled water. People used to drink water in the taps every day. I never saw bottled water when I was a child. But after 20, 30 years, 40 years, you will see that the air will be so polluted that you will have to carry a gas cylinder to survive. So imagine these uh, unbridled uh, exploitation of nature. So the consequences of this kind of development, let's also look at 
we call it development, but what are the consequences? Now, first important consequence of such big, uh, large scale development is that you need large industrial units. Small units cannot survive. The village industry, the domestic industry disappear. And therefore, you need big uh, financing and big uh, banks and you know, big units. As a result, you have concentration of wealth. Today, what happens? 1% population of the globe controls 40% of global assets. This is a fact. Uh, these are all facts from the economics and not, not created by me. Three richest individuals in the world have more combined wealth than 48 nations put together. And yesterday I was talking uh, in the EU chamber on this issue. I was told that the Walmart has more assets than how many of more than 50 countries in the world. The one single unit is. So these are the facts, you know, the combined wealth of 10 million millionaires was 41 trillion to one day. Can you believe that? And if you look at the growth which has taken place in the last, uh, say, 50, 60 years, our GDP has multiplied. If you go back to the time of your parents in Hungary, your GDP was small. Today it's maybe 20 times more than what it was. Eh? Still we have more poverty. Still we have more unemployment. Why? We have more unemployment today. The population was larger at that time. GDP was small, production was small, but people were employed. Today, you have reversed the system. Because you are having these large industrial units with automation. So you are replacing human beings with machines everywhere. Human being is too expensive to be employed, so they want to dispense with the human being. Why are we? For what? The whole system is made for us and we are dispensing with the human beings. This is what we have come to now. Now you can see these figures, uh, uh, how, uh, in fact, you are at risk because you are young. You will go to the job market very soon and you will find it very difficult to get a job with this kind of uh, economics we have in the world. And this is happening despite the continuous growth of economy in the last, say, four or five decades. You know. So you can imagine what will happen to your children and grandchildren if we continue on that path. Then not only that, we are poorer today than what we were before because of that vast disparity of income which we have created. Earlier people were in villages, towns, everybody had enough to eat, enough to survive. Today, we on the one hand, the people are billionaires. On the other hand, people are uh, living on the streets. They have no place to live. They know, know nothing to eat, no hospital to look after their health. So these are the figures you can see. According to FAO, 925 million people do not have enough to eat. That is in 2010. You can believe 925 million, almost 1 billion people. They don't have enough to eat. These are the official figures of Food and Agriculture Organization. 80% of those come from the developed country, 81% is 19% from the developed countries. But on the other hand, you see this enormous amount of food is wasted every day. You go to a five-star hotel here, the amount of waste which they create, the food which is left over, is more than five times than what you need to feed the poor people on the streets. I can assure you that. You put all the poor people of uh, Hungary in one place and the waste of the food which is done in these big places, five-star hotels and five-star restaurants, would be much more than what they need actually to survive. But this is the way we, we live today. We have created these kind of systems. This development has also led to a lot of urban slums, urban problems you see. You don't realize here, but you go to Mumbai or Delhi or you go to Sao Paulo or you go to South Africa, Johannesburg, you will find the large slums, people live like animals there, practically like animals, subhuman conditions I am telling you. There is no drinking water, no sanitation, uh, no proper space. Now what do you expect from those people? Because they have to work in those big industrial units which cannot work in the, in the rural areas. Rural jobs have been disappearing, one after another. So, they have to live in cities, there is no space in cities, things are very expensive, so they have to live in slums. Because they live in slums, their children have no education, no health 
security, they become criminal from the very childhood, so crimes are rising. Unhealthy conditions of living, crimes are rising. Then, also let me tell you, there is a word which I have been emphasizing, is dehumanization of humanity. What do I mean by that dehumanization of humanity? You, I don't know whether you have visited any of these big industrial units in the recent past, but you should visit as part of your education. Go to a OD factory or you go to the um, one of those, you know, car manufacturing units or refrigerator manufacturing units or clothes manufacturing units. Go on a visit. You will find a system called assembly line system. All these units are assembly line system of production now. There are 10 people sitting in a row. They, one person is just putting this glass here to here, here to here, whole day, 8 hours a day. That's what his job is. Nothing else. So he cannot think. It's total imagination mode. He is doing that repetitive job like a robot. So the human being has become a robot in flesh. Your mentality, is, your mind is not needed. Today people can't add 5 and 3 because they need a calculator to add because we don't use it. I never thought of that calculator when I was, because you, you need. So this, they are becoming robot in flesh and blood because of a repetitive job, 8 hours, 365 days in a year. Now what do you expect out of that human being? Tell me. The poor man will be absolutely tired, exhausted at the end of the day because his mental faculties were never used. So he will go out and drink and smoke. What else can you expect from him? So this is the way we are dehumanizing humanity in this kind of uh, productive systems. I call them robot in flesh and blood. This is what is happening to us because of these new uh, systems. Now let me come to the topic climate change you are talking about. Now these are the, what I said was just the glimpses of the development and the impact on us of the development. Now this is a very serious problem again. These are the facts which you can find on any of the official websites. Okay. There are many climate conventions climate change convention, there are a lot of negotiations going on, uh, Kyoto Protocol and you know there are, there are many many uh, conventions here. The facts are that increasing discharge of polluting substance into air, water and earth surface is going on. It is increasing every second. It has not decreased since the earth summit in Rio uh, of almost 20 years ago. It has increased many times. Industrial activities of modern civilization have raised atmospheric carbon dioxide level from 280 ppm to 375 ppm in the last 150 years. And they say if it exceeds 400, it is very dangerous for human health. And if it exceeds 500, then it will be really dangerous and you will have to carry a gas cylinder. Then rampant contamination of rivers and lakes. Uh, I, you are lucky here, but I have seen in countries the lakes have dried up, the rivers have become like uh, chemical, uh, you know, drains, not rivers anymore. They become chemical drains. You can't even recognize it's water or chemical. So this is what is happening. Uh, we are discharging a lot of solid waste on the earth's surface. It is contaminating the earth. We are using so many pesticides, so many. Uh, these uh, preservatives and the, all that chemical, even from morning it starts, we shampoo our hair and we put soap on our body and we wash our hands, that whole chemical goes into the earth surface ultimately. Okay? And the food you eat uh, has a lot of chemicals as well, a lot of preservatives are used. So you are eating chemicals and you are also draining chemicals into the, into the drains. So this is what uh, is happening to all of us. Now these are the facts which I have just put together just to give you an example that NASA there has been a considerable increase in greenhouse gases. You know greenhouse gases means that the, the heat of the earth remains trapped here. It doesn't get out into the outer atmosphere because of these gases. And then the temperatures rise. And because of rising temperatures, the glaciers melt, the ocean levels go up and all these things happen. And we have this erratic weather pattern, sometimes we have a long winter, long summer, erratic weather patterns all the time. 
that you have seen. So this is what is happening to us because of this. We also have growing health problems because of variety of reasons. The first health problem is that our physical exercise is reduced to zero. We all are driven into the cars or we, we don't walk, we don't work, we sit in classes, we sit in offices, no physical, that's one part. Secondly, the food we are eating is full of chemical content, full of pesticides, so that is leading to uh, the problems. Thirdly, we are eating more and more fast food because life is becoming very fast, you have no time to eat. So we have to eat fast, so that's also another problem leading to this. Stress is increasing because if you have to replace a cell phone or a computer or a new washing machine or a bigger house, we need to earn more, so the stress goes up. Then the stress levels are going up, which is also affecting our physical health because mind and body are directly connected. So these are some of the examples how we are affected, this lifestyle, automation, mechanization, all these things, this virtual world. Eh? And what is happening is that families are breaking apart. Alcoholism becoming rampant. People are taking antidepressant tablets very often. They can't sleep at night despite the huge wealth and huge bank balance. And this is what we have come to. So this is, there are uh, some of these things which I don't need to repeat. You know all of them. How uh, the development is affecting. If you look at the generation before, they were not so bad as we are. We are also having social conflict because of this development because the disparity of income is so much. On the one hand you have billionaires, on the one hand, on the other hand you have paupers. So because of that, there is social discontent, terrorism is on the rise, the ethnic conflicts are on the rise, intolerance is on the rise because of this problem of vast disparity in income and wealth in the nations, among the nations. And you have easy access to weapons and therefore you resort to more and more direct tactics. Now the question is, is this path sustainable? Can we continue on this path and for how long? Hmm? Can we continue to exploit more and more resources? Can we continue to contaminate the, the environment every day? Uh, can we continue to poison our mother earth and mother nature? Can we continue to do that? If so, for how long? Because if we continue to do that, the earth will be rendered inhabitable. Your children and grandchildren will not be able to live on this earth. Remember these words. If we continue on this path for long. And therefore we must understand that this is the most important issue for us. In the last 100 years we have done more damage to the environment than in the last 5000 years our ancestors did. This is a recorded fact and each one of us is responsible for that. The question is how we can reduce it. We can reduce it by simple living, austere living, less demands, less consumption, reducing the GDP, that is the answer. Because the less you want, it means more enlightened you are. You can be happy with less means you are a good person. If it is a, if it is a industrial unit which marks needs more input for X amount of output, it's not a good industry unit. The industry unit which needs less input for the same output is better, isn't it? It's economics. So, same applies to us. If I need less for my survival, I'm more enlightened. So, simple living is the answer. Austerity is the answer. The, the infinite cycle of demand is not an answer. Infinite cycle of demand and consumption will lead you to more stress and more dissatisfaction. In fact, that is the sign of dissatisfaction already because you are not satisfied with what you have. That's why you are wanting more and more. So, we have to uh, understand the, the nature of human desires. They are infinite in nature. They can never be complete, you know. Even if you have, I know people who had a bicycle, then they wanted a, a scooter. Once they got the scooter, they wanted a car. Once they got a car, they want a bigger car. They got a bigger car, they want five cars. Then they got five cars, they want a private jet to their, themselves. They got a private jet to themselves, they want a yacht. Even then they are not happy. 
I'm just giving you an example. So this nature of human desires is infinite. It can never be satisfied. We must understand that. And we have to understand that we should remain satisfied at some level. That is the answer. If we reduce our needs, we are more enlightened. If we can live with less, we are more enlightened. This reckless race for higher GDP and higher per capita income is a path to destruction. It's a path where our children and grandchildren will not see this earth. And this illusion of happiness which you think with all these bags and with all the consumption is not happiness. It's cause of more and more distress ultimately. This is what uh, is happening to all of us now. So what is wrong in having more Mahatma Gandhi and more Mandela and more Mother Teresa who need very little for their requirements? Mahatma Gandhi was called half naked fakir by Winston Churchill because he was not even properly fully clothed dressed. He had a very spartan dress and very you know simple lifestyle. So he was called half naked fakir. So I think we need more half naked fakirs in this world to sustain this environment. We need more people who live with less. This is what uh, we should teach to everybody. This is what the simple living means. It is not anti-development. It is the real enlightenment. Hmm? So I would like to conclude this presentation with one sloka from Sanskrit, which comes from Yajur Veda, which reads like this. Ayam nich paroveti ganna lagu chetsam udar charitanam tu vasudeva kutumbuka I am nish, this is mine, paro, this is yours. Ganna, this kind of tendency and counting is done by those who have very small and low mentality. For those who are enlightened, Udara Charitana, those who are enlightened, for them this entire earth is a single family. And for climate change, for environmental issues, we must understand that we are one single family, the entire earth. Because if we damage the climate anywhere, it doesn't respect any political boundaries. The damage can happen to any one of us. So this is more like a global village today than it was in the past. We must understand this concept. And with that, let us create a consciousness in the world that we should be happy with less consumption. We should be happy with less GDP. Not tinkering with the so-called sustainable development and green houses, those are just tinkering with the, uh, with the problem. These are not addressing the problem at the foundation. So, thank you very much, Kasanam Seva. If you have any question, I'll be very happy to answer. By understanding your own self, who you are, you have to understand who you are. These are the very fundamental questions of life. I am not a a machine consuming things all the time. No. But we say in, in, in Christianity you also say that we don't live to eat. We eat to live. We must understand that. But it's a larger concept. Uh, I can explain in another talk what it is. But the essence is this. Your Excellency, I uh, would like to ask your opinion about, about the water as, as a resource. So, for example, some experts consider that the next wars are, be, are going to be filled not for oil, for example, than water. So, in, in your opinion, um, can you actually imagine a water war before going for water? So, do you think it's possible in, in the coming 20, 30 years? 
I'm sure it is going to happen, not possible. I'm sure it will happen. It has already started in certain ways. Uh, oil, if you don't get, you will abandon your vehicle, okay? You will not use, you can still walk. But if you don't get water, you cannot survive. You can't even live. So survival is an essential instinct of every human being. When our survival is at stake, we will fight, isn't it? We all fight. And this is happening already. It's happening in the Asian part of the world. Uh, there are uh, several rivers which have been completely contaminated. And there's water scarcity. In my own country, there's water scarcity. In China, there's a big problem on the rivers. Uh, in uh, some of the Latino countries, there's a big problem on the rivers. Uh, in fact, I was in UNESCO. I knew this problem. They have this convention on water, conferences on water. And not in about 20 years time, in your own lifetime, you will see people fighting for water, a liter of water. And in fact, I went a little ahead of that. I was telling you that you will fight even for air. Because the contamination will be so much that you will have to get a cylinder of a gas for yourself. If we continue on this part. My name is Richard Bush, I'm just here at Corbin's University. Um, I have a question about the role of technology and innovation in this. Uh, humankind has traditionally used technology to solve their problems. Do you think in this case, as far as climate change goes, is technology something that's going to help us, or in the end it's going to hurt us? I think technology is a mixed bag. Uh, what is happening today in the name of technology? Like I was in this EU chamber meeting yesterday, I was telling you. People say that we are producing more efficient refrigerator every year. So it forces you to change your refrigerator every year. For them it's good because they're selling more. But for you, how many refrigerators can you change? This will say 30% less electricity consumption. This is efficient. This is uh, more eco-friendly in that way. So this is one way of looking at technology. So it is forcing you to consume more in the name of technology. The more efficient car, the better car, the better cell phone, the better refrigerator, they will call it green. They will say less electricity consumption, less power consumption. But more production. More production means ultimately that everything is consumed more. While producing you consume more, you consume more uh, mineral resources, you consume more water, you consume pollute more air, you pollute more water. So this is one part of technology. If we change the technological aspect fundamentally, then it can be positive side. Now that is not happening because of the business interest. Nobody wants to change fundamentally. Let me give one example. I am a great believer of naturopathy and Ayurveda treatment which is based on herbal and you know natural things or yoga, yogic exercises, for example. Now, this is not acceptable to pharmaceutical industry, to med, to hospital industry, because they, their whole industry is at stake if this comes up. So they will not allow that to happen. They have no strong lobbies. They can poison your body with chemicals, but they will not allow you to use the natural substances for curing yourself, because that will kill their industry. They don't mind killing human beings, but they mind killing the industry. This is the problem which happens. So I think at some stage humanity will realize that we are on the wrong path in this way. So some of the, the so-called primitive technologies are very good for us. They're designed to keep the human being. Like we have a technology now of cars and you know jets and all that. They're not designed for human body. We lose all exercises. We don't have, people have a spinal problem, people have uh, stress, people have sleeplessness because they don't do physical exercise in the morning, in the daytime. They're just sitting somewhere. So all these problems come up. So there are positive and negative sides. Like for example, this energy with solar and uh, this, this is a good, good, good sign if we can use it locally and for local requirements. It's a very good sign. 
but let's see how it works. Any more? Yes, I, I have one okay. more very, very tough question. So, so basically, you highlighted that in the last 5,000 years, basically, you know, the, the used resources, you know, that which is much more, much less than, than in the last 100 years. So basically, what I see about this climate change, that, that the rich countries are responsible for the last 100 years, basically, they are responsible for the the majority of the global warming in the past. Yes. But in the future, because of the, of the population yeah. growing faster than the, the so-called under the old part of the world, you know, that it can happen that they will be responsible for the future. Yes. So it, it, so it seems to me that, that nobody are really taking seriously these issues, you know, because, because those who are living today and would like to do what they are, they are the right to say that you are responsible because of the past. But those who are speaking about the future, you will be responsible for the future. So it means that you know that we cannot negotiate, we cannot sign any agreement, you know, nothing happens. So at least in, in my own career in the last 40 years, you know, we are doing something, you know, we're speaking a lot, but we are not able to reach any common understanding of the issues. Everything you see, this part is uh, totally misplaced. <laughs> this whole debate is misplaced. <clears throat> because to begin with, countries like India and China and other developing countries, they think that they will become developed by adopting the US and the European path. It's wrong. It's misplaced. My personal view. I'm not talking as ambassador of India here. I'm talking in my personal capacity. That's not the path of development. That is the path of destruction. That is the path of <laughs> natural destruction and also our own destruction. The path which we should be following for development is the path of enlightenment that is to reduce our needs and that is to be happy with the less. That is what I believe is the real path of development. And therefore, if these people claiming the developing countries that we should also destroy the nature for another 50 years to reach the level of developed countries. I think that's misplaced. That's my mind. I think they need to be told that this is not the right path. They already done mistakes has been done by others, but the first the developed countries must reduce their consumption. <coughs> they must reduce the size of these enterprises. They should have more rural uh, enterprises uh, so that the you know, concentration of wealth reduces. The people are using their faculties, human faculties, more than becoming robots in these machines uh, oriented to your places. I think that change is needed in the entire world. And this is possible through a thinking process of the younger generation like you. So it would be nice to authorize ourselves to sign a common agreement, probably with the easier. <laughs> yes, yeah. Than, uh, certainly, the, the certainly. Yes. It's a pity that we are not uh, authorized. Is there any? If not, then, then I would like to thank you for your excellent presentation. I am really happy that it was to really work. And, and I wish you great successes in your future. And I hope so that we shall see you again in our, our university. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. But before I go, I want to ask you sincerely, what I said, does it make sense to you? This is what I want to hear from you. Tell me whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense. People agree with me or not? Yes? Okay. okay. This is what... Don't be, you're not forced, please. If you don't agree, please tell me no. I, I just have one question with yes. that respect. Um, how, if, how do we get here if we should have been happy before? How do we? How, how did we get here mm -hmm. if we should have been happy uh, with the simple life? Precisely. You see, this is what forced me to write this book which I've written. I was wondering in my mind that in the last 
our ancestors lived at least the written history of the world is at least five six thousand years. Our ancestors lived five six thousand years. Why couldn't they create the innovations which we have done? We have created aircrafts and the missiles and the virtual world and you know the kind of things we have created in the last hundred years are unbelievable, eh? including atom bombs and you know the new systems of production. Were our ancestors not intelligent enough? That was the question coming to my mind. Why didn't they do it? And that's why it made me to work and research why they didn't do it. They knew that this path is destructive. And they did not adopt this path. They wanted a simpler lifestyle, closer to the nature. And that is the answer which I am finding to my uh, question which came to my mind four or five years ago. And I have been working on that since then. So I think we must understand that our ancestors did not adopt this path because they were wiser. That's it. So thank you very much, Kasanam Sepa, and I wish you good luck in your exams. <laughs>